Hello, hello. Hey there. Good morning, afternoon, or evening. We'll get started about five past. All right, thanks. Morning. Morning, morning. They can. So far, I see you, Camille, and Sam right now. We're waiting for Alexis. Oh, Jonathan Bull is here too. Is uh, Brian Cantrell on? Yep, I'm here. Hey, morning. Morning. Hey, hey Chris. All right, we'll get started in a couple more minutes. Chris, have you put the link in the uh, Slack? Yes, there it is. Oh, thanks. Is uh, Ben, Brian, Grant, or Solomon here? Let's see them right now. I'm giving another minute. I know Brian Grant sometimes is late. Uh, Chris Solomon's not on the TUC anymore. That's uh, true, but. It's his last, uh, quote unquote, last. He, he said he was going to show up. All right, it's about five past. I think we've uh, waited long enough. Uh, 
Alexis, uh, you want to get started? We've got six members of the TOC on. Hey, um, thanks very much, Chris. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome back to the meeting. I'm sorry I've been away for such a long time. Um, let's just jump straight into the agenda. And uh, we're going to go through a couple of presentations today, and we're going to discuss the Prometheus graduation, um, a bit of working group stuff, and of course the announcements of the TOC election results. Um, so let's let's do that first, Chris. Oh, actually, you've got the Cubicle announcement first. What is this slide six? Um, yeah, th this is basically. I'm just letting people know we're canceling our uh, meeting on May first because uh, a, lot, a lot of us are at the conference and instead we're going to do kind of uh, booth hours. So folks like Alexis and I will have office hours at the CNCF booth for people that want to talk to TOC members. I don't know who else on the TOC is uh, going at KubeCon, but it would be nice to know so I could add you to uh, the office hours list. I'll be there, Chris. Yeah, okay. Feel free to reach out to me over email for those uh, that are under TOC that want to be on the on the office hours. I mean, it would be good for anyone who's a TOC contributor to um, to meet other members of the TOC. So I think, you know, we should continue to strive to bring people together. Um, I don't know what you and Dan feel about doing something, maybe attaching something to the GB get together. Perhaps you could buy everybody a glass of something fizzy. Okay. Yeah. Just a thought. Sounds like, sounds like an idea. Cool. Um, all right, so let's go on to the um, election results. Now, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is these results are voted on by the um, other members of the TOC. Yep. Um, on vetted candidates uh, who step forward and are the, the two seats that are, that are elected by the TOC from those vetted candidates, correct? And they stand for one year, they, they, they run for one year and two years, correct? Yep, and I got to do a quick, uh, well, first we can make the announcement that uh, <clears throat> Brian Grant uh, was reelected in Quinton Hall, uh, was elected as, for the second seat. Uh, so um, Solomon is no longer a TOC member and we want to wish him the best and thank him for his service uh, since this whole thing was getting started. Uh, so um, there's 10 total candidates I ran, so thank you to everyone there. I got to do a quick, uh, crazy kind of coin toss to decide who gets the two-year term versus one-year term seat. So I'm just going to go share my screen really quick, um, see if everyone sees this. Are we confident there's no CGI at work here? Yeah, I, I hope so. Everyone see my screen? I'll take that as a yes. All right. I'm going to go flip. All right, we I got see, heads. I think we need to talk about like, you know, um, like <laughs> how many how many flips we have to do before we just select. Uh, heads, it's done. So uh, going back to the slides. So uh, Brian gets the uh, two-year term and Quinton gets the one-year term. So I will stop sharing my screen and we'll go back to Alexis. So thanks for participating, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks, Chris, and congratulations to Brian and Quinton. I want to say a few things here. I really, really want to thank Solomon, who I know he hasn't been able to make every single meeting, um, or even, you know, he's come to some of the meetings, but I do believe that Docker lending their support wholeheartedly to this process at a crucial stage has been very important for the evolution of the CNCF. And please note that most of that originated from Solomon. He was the person who bought into the vision um, of having this community and Docker being part of it. And I think it's very important to recognize. Thank you very much, Solomon. Um, also, uh, congratulations to all the candidates. We had a really strong field uh, with some very close voting. Please, please do not be disheartened if you didn't get you know, what you wanted. Stand again, please keep helping. Um, we really need your help to make this thing successful, whether you have a vote or not. So I'm gonna move on to the next slide now. And um, we're gonna talk about Prometheus for graduation review. Um, in my opinion, uh, having originally sponsored the project, uh, it has done more than enough to graduate. Um, the number of maintainers has grown, which is one of the goals that uh, Chris and Dan and I and the maintainers had a year ago. 
when we convened at uh, KubeCon in Berlin. Um, but one thing I will say is that Prometheus is still in need of a lot of help. This is a project which doesn't get all the limelight like Kubernetes does. If you uh, know people who say, how can I contribute to CNCF if I'm a developer? Um, there's plenty of work to do on Prometheus. You don't have to send everybody to Kubernetes. There are other projects as well. So I voted plus one for this project, and I hope you all do as well. Any, anything else we need to say at this point, Chris, on this particular topic? No, vote is live. Uh, feel free to make any comments on the mailing list or GitHub issues if you have concerns. Yeah, please vote. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Right. Um, next topic. The working group process. Yeah, so um, I, I could speak quickly on this one, Alexis. So uh, we've been approached by a couple of folks that want to propose new working groups, and we don't really have a formalized process where someone could just issue a PR like they do with project proposals. So this is just basically solidifying kind of what we um, expect folks to do. So I took our existing working groups and basically sketched out what their proposals looked like when they first came forward and outlined them. And now moving forward, we'll have a simple process where folks could actually submit a PR and present and you know comment and vote on like we typically do with projects any comments anyone so my, my big concern with the working group process is that while well meant um, we haven't you know we don't have a system for working groups and you know, we've reached the point now where we've explored the space a bit, we've kicked the tires, we've experimented, we've seen a few successes, a few non-successes, and now we need to get serious about it. Um, so if anyone would like to help me and Chris to figure that out in, with a written document, I would really appreciate it. So please send Chris an email volunteering to help. This is a TOC contributor opportunity, or if you have a vote, um, or if you've recently been elected or re-elected, this could be a great chance to prove that everyone made the right decision. Um, but please do help. This is an important area. Without some clarity, working groups will stutter. Um, they can't continue forever based on energy alone. So what exactly are you asking for? People to volunteer to help me and Chris write down a document with a bit more structure around what is a working group, how it's supposed to run, what its objective should be, how to propose it, and things like that. Are, is is explosion of working groups a concern, or, or do you think that's a good a, a fine and good thing? I think a greater concern for me is that some of the working groups have um, are not quite sure what to do next and what their you know what their exit and, and success criteria are, rather than an explosion. So uh, this is Dan Shaw. We're presenting a uh, you know, safe uh, working group proposal uh, later in this meeting. Um, I don't think that, uh, you know, I'm necessarily in a position to, to help in this definition, but I want to uh, sort of raise our hand as we're uh, going through the process uh, to be uh, guinea pig and, and fodder for, uh, you know, testing this process and uh, working through that. So, um, you know, please feel free to, to lean on us, uh, you know, in that process and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll help document along the way if we have a, a partner in uh, the TOC. Thank you. Yeah, Alexis, you can count on me to help you guys out. I've been That's got some right. ideas based on the work group effort so far. Appreciate that. Thanks. Okay, great. Okay, the um, next slide is project proposals. So we have telepresence and open messaging um, coming up as sandbox. Um, I should just say a word about, I know we had this um, show of hands vote on sandbox versus some other names. Um, there was an even split between sandbox and workshop and people seem to be settling down around sandbox. So I think that kind of concludes that discussion. There wasn't a clear, clear vote for an alternative, I'm afraid. So uh, unless anybody wants to throw themselves in front of the truck right now, sandbox it's going to be. Um, so we have the two proposals for the uh, new newly named junior tier coming in. I'm the sponsor of Telepresence. I have interviewed several customers of the project, end users, and I'm quite impressed. 
Um, it does fit Sandbox well in the sense that it's not completely obvious that it shouldn't be part of a larger project or go in, or really what direction to go into. But I feel that it shows the right kind of green shoots of a young project to de deserve backing at Sandbox level. Um, I don't know who is going to st stick up their hand for open messaging, Chris. No one yet. Okay, so that one's looking for a sponsor. All right, should we go straight into Rich's presentation? Sure, can everyone hear me? I can hear you, Richard. Yeah, loud and clear. All right, so, uh, so I'll start in slide 12. So um, the problem that we're trying to solve with telepresence is just improving the experience of the app dev on Kubernetes. And today, if you're setting up a development environment for Kubernetes, you essentially have two major choices. One is local development using something like Minikube or Docker Compose or now Docker for Mac. Um, the pros are you don't need a network. Um, you're isolated from other developers, so any changes you make, you have your own little sandbox, um, not to overload the term. You can use all your local tools like your IDE or auto reload with some configuration. Um, the challenge of this is that you can't run resource hungry services, right? So as soon as your application goes beyond a few services or maybe one service if you're using Java, uh, your laptop starts to get really hot and um, it starts to melt down. Um, and so the alternative then is cloud development where you run Kubernetes in cloud and then you have some sort of deployment system like scaffold or draft or CI or something, any of these things. Um, the pro is that you can guarantee that your production environment and your development environment are exactly the same. You can run the exact same version of Kubernetes in the exact same place. The challenge is that it requires a network. You can't use your local development tools. There's a higher latency. Um, so uh, you have to push to a registry and do all these things and uh, developers sort of uh, an impatient bunch. Um, and so on slide 13, um, so this is why we created telepresence. So telepresence is a, a hybrid model. So you essentially run all your dependencies, your services, your databases and applications in Kubernetes in the cloud or locally, um, you know, depending on your configuration, but typically it's in the cloud. And then the service that you're actually coding on um, or set of services, you actually run locally in a container or directly on your laptop and the benefit is you're able to use your development tools like your IDE, your debugger, auto reload, curl, um, et cetera. And by running the rest of your application in the cloud, you can actually use cloud databases and you have access to unlimited compute um, and memory. So um, on slide 14, the way this works is we deploy a two-way proxy on the Kubernetes cluster and uh, we also run a client locally on your laptop to connect to the proxy and we expose things like config maps, secrets, access to other services. We also let you proxy to other cloud resources like for example, Amazon RDS or any other sort of cloud database. Um, we actually, uh, telepresence has really grown organically. So we actually have currently three different methods of proxying. Um, which we are trying to figure out when we recommend one versus the other. We have a VPN type um, approach, which uses S shuttle, which is a VPN over SSH. Uh, we started with this method called inject TCP, which injects a shared library by hacking LD preload on Linux or dinlib on Mac into a sub process. Um, the benefit of inject TCP is it works with your existing VPN. And then we also use, uh, we also support using Docker run directly, which lets us uh, hijack um, and take advantage of Docker's networking capabilities instead of uh, maintaining a VPN of our own. So, um, so that's generally how it works. Um, on slide 15, um, so we have about 700 stars and growing pretty steadily on, uh, on, on GitHub. We have uh, a bunch of users, um, Bitnami is actually, and I see ours on the call, she's giving a talk at KubeCon about how they use uh, telepresence with cube apps. Namely, um, company in New York City has actually integrated telepresence with Istio. Um, we've got a couple case studies um, from some other companies that use, Site Machine uses telepresence because they run a lot of ML and uh, the ML programs don't work well running locally on your laptop, but they also wanna use PyCharm, the IDE. Um, 
And then we also have a variety of non-public uh, enterprise users um, who I'm happy to talk about off list. Um, and like I said, the common use cases that we see are people are, uh, they wanna use IDEs or their laptop isn't powerful enough to run everything in Minikube. So a lot of people start with Minikube and then they run out of memory um, and they start looking for something else. Um, so last slide on telepresence. So our interest in CNCF is we're really focused on the app developer trying to reduce that friction in building multi-service applications on Kubernetes. And sort of uh, there's been a bunch of threads. We've been talking a lot with the scaffold team, but we really would like to try to grow the Kubernetes app dev community in general. We think that's sort of one of the big next frontiers in conversation around how do we improve? And there's lots of stuff going on with the application CRD and the app dev working group and developer tools and workflow. We just think um, from our own experience that the maturity of the developer experience on Kubernetes is definitely a work in progress. We also would like to expand the telepresence community. So the core maintainers all work at DataWire today. Um, we'd like to expand to other maintainers. We have some maintainers who work on very relatively small parts of the system. Like we have um, someone who helps with OpenShift support and we have someone who packages uh, telepresence for specific Linux distributions, but we'd love to get some more core maintainers and also more users who can help each other because there is a lot of sort of best practices and configuration and we don't use every single IDE under the sun. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so that's, that's the basics. Um, happy to take any questions. Yeah, I had a quick question. Um, it seems that, so, so you do need a network connection from your laptop to the cloud in order to use this. Um, and given that, uh, I guess one alternative approach would be to run the IDEs uh, on the cloud and use like a virtual desktop, remote desktop kind of tool to get to the IDE. Did, did you consider that approach um, as, as an alternative? I mean, it, se it seems a lot simpler, but I, c I can see some downsides. Did you think about that at all or wait up? Uh, we, we just, we honestly, we started telepresence as just a prototype and we didn't spend a whole bunch of time thinking about it. Uh, so, so the honest answer is we didn't really consider running your IDE in the cloud. Since then, we've sort of thought about it and it seems to be a little complicated. Um, and, uh, and also with some of the things, I should have actually talked a little bit about some of the things that we are actually working on because probably the biggest piece of feedback people want is faster startup and better, con uh, better reliable reliability over poor network connections. So we're actually working on things like auto reconnect and um, speeding up uh, the startup process because right now starting up a telepresence process takes 20 to 30 seconds and it really doesn't need to. So we're trying to get it down to two or three seconds. And I think that deploying your IDE remotely would probably be harder to do. Um, with that setup. So uh, if you don't mind, Quentin, uh, I can probably add on to that. For those of you who don't know me, um, Matt Farina, I do SIG apps over in Kubernetes. I work on a lot of the app tooling. Um, so when it comes to IDEs though, you know, Visual Studio Code is the most popular from the latest surveys. There's Vim versus Emacs debates. This for developers is a really personal thing. And I think the popular, um, dev tools like this are all still desktop based. The cloud based ones haven't taken off as much as the traditional desktop ones that we have all used. And so I like that telepresence hooks up this way because it's not forcing you to use a different IDE. It kind of meets you where you're already at. Uh, just, just to be clear, I wasn't suggesting using a cloud based IDE. I was suggesting just running an IDE on a essentially a desktop in the cloud uh, and then using a remote uh, desktop technology to get to it and not, not running a cloud IDE. So run exactly the IDE that you normally run, but just don't run it on your laptop, run it on a cloud server. Yeah, and I think that's, that, that's, a, that's an interesting proposal. And I have to say, we just haven't, we haven't thought too much about it, but um, yeah, so I don't have a great answer for you. Um, so other than we, we have a thing that works now. Thanks. Thanks. Richard, maybe one other point of clarification, the debugging that this facilitates um, using your local development environment and your, your local tools, 
um, this doesn't extend to a distributed debugging scenario where you're able to debug services that are running on the remote cluster? No, uh, we. I was just referring to, you know, especially like Java developers like to set breakpoints, yeah. right, in, in their IDE uh, and things like that. So it's really debugging scope to your single service, but uh, we, we don't really touch anything around, uh, say, distributed tracing, for example. example. Yeah. Anyone? Uh, there's a question about volume mounts into the containers running locally. So, uh, so one of the things we actually support is if you're using the container method, um, if we actually let you, I mean, we, we just uh, pass through uh, incantations Docker run. And so if you want to do a local volume mount into your container, that's one way you can actually support hot reload with your IDE. So you can save to your local file system that volume is mounted into the container and that actually gets proxy to um, proxied uh, into your Kubernetes cluster. So, um, so that's a technique we use um, for auto reload. Uh, it's a little trickier if you want to use a debugger. So. But just to elaborate on that though, are you saying that you can or you cannot share a volume between your local development and the thing running in the cloud? You can. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right. Well, thanks everyone. What, 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 what do you kind of expect the project to end up looking like, you know, down the road when it's been in the sandbox for a while or coming out of the sandbox? Do you expect it to end up being a standalone tool or some sort of library that gets integrated into IDEs or, or what kind of what thing would you expect going forward? Uh, I think uh, this, to me, this is a, a grand experiment, right? And this is one reason why I like the sandbox concept because we're not sure uh, if it may, it will ultimately live as a standalone. We think it's useful functionality that's important um, that people will use, but we can see it being integrated into a larger project uh, or it could be maintained as a standalone thing and more functionality will be added over time. And that's one reason why uh, we would be very happy to just get more users to see sort of what the trends are um, because right now I can tell you the trends are IDEs and Minikube um, and I can't put enough RAM into my laptop, but that may not be true as we grow. Um, and uh, so, so I certainly don't think we're ready for um, whatever the uh, incubation, I think. Yeah. So, so, so the short answer is we don't know and we're very curious to find out. Richard, last question uh, from me, and that's maybe this is obvious in the documentation, but I, I think I'm only seeing references to uh, Minikube as the where you would run your local services. Is is that correct? There's a dependency there, and that's kind of the only supported um, local cluster. Uh, that's the only supported local cluster, but that would be, uh, and there's some people who use that configuration, but that's more of an anomaly. Um, usually your Kubernetes cluster would be running in the cloud and then you would run the service that you're coding as a local process on your laptop, not uh, if, that, if that makes sense. Um, right, so you can run it locally on your laptop or run it locally on your laptop inside a container. Um, so those are the two most common methods and then um, everything else runs in a Kubernetes cluster, uh, not on your laptop. I like this idea and I'm willing to be the other TOC sponsor. Super, thank you. Hey Richard, um, I know Camille's not requesting this, but I think it would make sense for her to be put in touch with the same people that I spoke to as your end users. Sure, yeah, that's happy. I'm happy to do that. Anyone else? Okay.
think we are moving on to the safe working group proposal. Thank you very much, Richard. All right. So uh, we're going to start on uh, slide uh, 17 and bop into 18 pretty much right away. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Dan Shaw. I'm joined today by JJ and Sarah Allen. Uh, we are uh, the co-conspirators uh, that have been uh, pulling together uh, this working group proposal uh, that centers around secure access to uh, to build, you know, now that we have our, our infrastructure sort of elevated into the cloud, we all have uh, shared visibility from operators to administrators to developers to DevOps to that cloud infrastructure. And uh, our, our group uh, has identified that, you know, it's, it's there, we have access to it, uh, but what's lacking is a shared vocabulary and shared mechanisms to, to convey that system integrity, to understand that uh, we do indeed have uh, secure for all of those parties uh, the access and uh, a safe system that we're working with. Um, so JJ so will take over uh, for slide 19. Thanks, Dan. Uh, thanks, Chris and Alex for uh, Alexis for having us over here. Um, so, like what Dan mentioned. Uh, I'll go over a little bit of what SAFE is about, a uh, little history and uh, YS part of it. Um, we believe secure access is an end-to-end -end concern in a heterogeneous system. So security solved within a system uh, doesn't actually lend itself to providing a full-on end-to-end security. Uh, we've seen this several times in uh, several systems and uh, we all believe that there needs this needs to be addressed as a common concern. Um, so uh, the idea is to understand the common, uh, common problems around security with uh, all these infrastructures and then centralize the infrastructure, which to some extent is already happening with uh, Spiffy and OPA and a few other projects, but then uh, that needs to get centralized. And that's the, that's the vision and the idea with which uh, we are driving this effort towards. A little bit of history is, uh, uh, this appeared as a common problem way back uh, uh, when Chris Ray, when I was brainstorming with Chris Ray last summer. So uh, obviously we weren't ready for it at that time and uh, many of us organically came together over, over time to address this as a, as a problem. Um, and a quick, uh, quick note on why us. Uh, I'll be happy to address any of the pointed questions after that, but uh, I just wanted to give you like a brief overview of what, uh, what, what we're trying to accomplish here. Why us, like many of us who come, to, uh, come here has previously built uh, uh, security infrastructure at scale uh, in some of these companies, um, like people from, uh, people from Netflix, Cloud Foundry, um, Google, um, and uh, I think Torrent here as well. Opa. So a lot of a lot of people have faced customers, faced real problems, uh, and a lot of us understand that this is a co common cross-cutting concern across heterogeneous heterogeneous infrastructure. So, uh, and with this collective knowledge, uh, we hope we'll be able to address many of the many of the system architecture that's required that's required for an end-to-end -end secure access. Uh, come up with common vocabulary to help define end-to-end uh, -end security. And we also believe like there are lots of gaps and libraries and protocols that needs to be introduced or built uh, to enable a full-on end-to-end secure infrastructure. And the idea is like this empathizes more with the operators and developers uh, as the workflow happens. So security becomes a built-in process along the way. I'll touch briefly upon how we plan on go about doing it, and uh, we'd be happy to take any comments on this and uh, suggestions to uh, improve this process. Uh, we had a draft charter, um, which we have it done, and then uh, the vision statements all there. Uh, we went through discovery where a uh, lot of people, uh, including people from NASD, presented uh, their use cases and uh, their understanding of what secure access means. and 
you've gathered a lot of it in the document. It's still an ongoing process. And uh, uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Sarah, who will carry us through the details of uh, how we are planning about going. And for those that are playing along at home, we're on slide 20. Yep. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Um, thanks, JJ and Dan. Um, so I'm going to talk about primarily this sort of steps two, three, and four, and how we get to um, having some clear recommendations in this um, space, which is actually pretty fractured right now. Um, and, um, and I think there's a lot of projects in the CNCF which are, are doing good work in this area. But like JJ says, that we, you know, going to slide 21, like how do we pull together a secure system? How do we even describe it when, you know, if we have Spiffy and we have OPA, those aren't themselves enough like they have to probably be combined with other things and there's a lot of people who have strong opinions in this area so through we've, we've come up with this process that seems to be working really well that we've been doing um like dan said since january where almost every week we have a, a presentation from um one of the members or, or or guests where people will share um the problems that they're experiencing their the solutions that they have um where they see um the what's leading them to want to collaborate or what's working for them and um, and often we'll have like a half an hour presentation and a half hour discussion which means that we're pulling these use cases out of data that's more than coming from our experience and more than what's in our head which means that we are all discovering together which um, is, is just turned into like a really nice um, community exercise where we're all learn having deeper learning in the space that is out beyond our own experience. And we're all curious about these systems that we each um, are developing software that needs to interoperate, or in some cases are deploying a bunch of these systems together. So that's really the discover phase that we're in. When we finish up these use cases, then we'll attempt to draw some kind of diagram. Some people in the working group thinks we can't have one, maybe there are three. We don't know exactly what it is, but after we have these use cases, we um, will at least attempt to make a draft of that. And um, we think that by breaking up into these three phases, that'll kind of help keep us focused and help feel like there's momentum because we expect this to be a little bit of a process, uh, a time consuming process. But, um, but with artifacts emerging from the process, you know, every couple of months, um, we think that even though um, it takes a long time, that it's, it can be very fruitful in the interim. So the second phase is really looking at standards because there are a lot of standards in this space. We'll look at the CNCF project, see which standards are widely adopted, whether there are clear winners that are working for the community and we can just highlight those in um, a clear way, whether they're, it's fractured, whether people are adopting different standards and thereby not interoperable. And out of, out of that process, um, really refine the common definitions and, and come up with this uh, a vocabulary or glossary in this space. Because like in many of these um, cloud native um, technologies, people are using um, different words to mean the same thing or um, overlapping definitions and terminology. And then we can call back to the use cases and see where they're used potentially. And so, um, so after that kind of cataloging um, of the, the standards and protocols and definitions, um, the next step is to really catalog um, the projects. What is What are people using in terms of software solution? So which uh, CNCF projects are related? And fill in the boxes so that we end up with really sketching out what this ecosystem is and what we want it to be. And we anticipate that there are some gaps. There are some that each of us are, is motivated to come to this working group because we see gaps. Um, we don't necessarily agree on what those are right now, but by, we get to, by the time we get to phase four, we think we'll ha having that shared vocabulary and having a deeper understanding of the space that's written down, um, we think that we can clarify what those gaps are and they may be improvements that we, we might say that this project, we recommend adopt this protocol that four other projects use, or it might be that there's a project missing or a library missing, or we're open to what those gaps are. And um, we, what we wanna do is by pulling together as a community that we can focus on um, making some recommendations about filling those gaps in a way that's going to be efficient to getting to us to this end-to-end -end security that crosses clouds and crosses on-prem 
and um, the cloud providers, which we all see as a, um, a critical concern for anybody who's doing um, substantial cloud native apps. So this all culminates in a recommendation and I'm going to hand this off to Dan, who's going to review our proposal. Great. Great. So uh, that'll uh, uh, land us on slide 22. Um, so you know, with that, uh, with the context that um, you know, this group that, that's been gathering uh, since uh, you know, basically KubaCon Austin uh, last year uh, and meeting regularly uh, you know, this past quarter, um, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, our, our thought that that interest in, um, you know, this, this cross cutting concern, uh, of safety, uh, is, uh, a great fit for the CNCF. Um, a couple of non goals, uh, you know, we're, we're not here to, to choose a single, uh, provider or single security, uh, technology. And, uh, you know, obviously we aren't a, uh, a standards body for, for creating standards. Um, but we are a um, you know a, a broad group of uh, you know, concerns across the cloud ecosystem, uh, and you know, we would love to you know, bring this to the, the CNCF uh, and our our asks are specifically um, you know, we'd we'd like to get as many use cases in. Uh, you know, we, we've we've already uh, gone through a few. We had some some great presentations from the folks at NIST. Uh, um, Cloud Foundry and, and Google, uh, and you know, we'd we'd love the opportunity in this discovery phase to work with members and projects and uh, integrate that into this this broader safety story. And um, you know we're looking for a TOC sponsor that um, you know is is uh, going to join us for you know a fairly long journey. So. Uh, you know, uh, I, I want to make sure that you're, you're aware up front that, uh, uh, you know, we expect this to be a, a bit of a process, not an infinite process, um, but uh, a better part of a year. Thank you very much. Now we'll open so up. I have a question. Um, are you, um, <clears throat> if, if there was a, a security project that was in the sandbox or incubation, um, just doing open source code, what would you like your relationship with that to be? So at present, uh, you know, I believe what we can offer to that group is uh, to uh, listen and provide feedback in terms of uh, the data that we've con collected so far. Uh, but at present, we are not in a position to uh, you know, direct or uh, add towards the solution. So we can partner, we, we can, uh, you know, help them gain perspective on, uh, you know, some of the other um, concerns, other um, peers that they may have in, in uh, you know, the cloud native ecosystem, um, but we would not uh, you know, be uh, uh, mature enough as a working group to provide any uh, explicit feedback, feedback or any explicit direction. Well, so, so I'll chime so, in a little bit because yeah. I've thought about this a little bit. I, not to, I think everything Dan says is right. Um, we want to set expectations that we are uh, nascent. You know, we're, we've, got a, we've got a group of people that are coming together for a purpose and have, um, you know, for many of us, a, 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 an hour a week plus the async activities is a significant time com commitment. However, we think that by being a CNCF working group, we could potentially provide a structure where we say that, you know, anybody who, any new project that um, is, seems related, um, we would invite them to just sign up for a presentation. So then instead of us going and finding everyone, we would just have this steady stream. And so we would, um, uh, we would offer the TOC that um, after that presentation, we'd record it, we would write our summary. And in the discovery phase, that's pretty much all we would do, right? We would, the observations of the people of the working group. Later, um, we would be able to place this project in our diagram, in the landscape, and we would ask them to validate is this feel like where you belong, right? And so we would, you know, it's, it's not like new projects are adopted every week or something. So there's a pace that um, I think would be reasonable. 
And so then so the new projects are fitting themselves into the landscape. And then we're echoing that back to the TOC. Not, not we wouldn't have to present in a meeting or anything, but anyone could check in on that progress. And, and it might contribute to, it certainly would have helped me when Spiffy was um, being proposed. I tried to review it and it took me a long time to seat where it lived in the identity landscape. So, um, so that's so, an idea. So specifically, uh, yeah, uh, specifically to address the two projects that uh, Alex has asked about uh, in CNCF, uh, I am part of uh, Spiffy uh, Six Spec, so I'm working on it, and I bring in like the perspective uh, that from there. Uh, I've been uh, fairly involved uh, in giving comments and feedback to OPA from way early on, and Torin is part. Of part of this uh, working group already. So uh, as far as those two projects are, go uh, are concerned, uh, we're good to go. Mm -hmm. And for the new ones, uh, we would like to have a similar or deeper uh, integration with the newer projects so we can actually uh, flow back and forth the information. Uh, if not, uh, we'd have to identify and understand like what Sarah and Dan were saying uh, to make them present and uh, us getting involved in that project. I had a quick uh, question and or comment, depending on which way you look at it. Um, so a lot of this work has de facto happened in the SIG auth uh, special interest group uh, inside Kubernetes. Uh, it's not, you know, its mandate is not the same as this working group, um, but, but de facto for lack of a better place, these are where most of these discussions have been happening. Um, so question, uh, what is the relationship between this working group and SIG auth in Kubernetes, or stated another way, I, I think that it would be very beneficial to have a very close working relationship between those two groups. Otherwise, we're gonna end up with, you know, two bodies doing very significantly overlapping work, potentially diverging. So, uh, you know, I'll let uh, you know, Sarah or JJ speak to SIG auth, uh, you know, specifically. Um, but uh, in another uh, Kubernetes group, uh, SIG, SIG policy, uh, it, you know, we, we've already begun uh, sort of cross-pollinating with that group. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, you know, all the work that's happening in Kubernetes is you know, kind of uh, you know, leading uh, a lot of the direction that, that's happening. Um, but you know, there are all the other uh, you know, infrastructure components in the cloud native ecosystem that, you know, aren't Kubernetes. Uh, and, you know, while, while some of us, including myself, uh, you know, may believe that, that, that Kubernetes is uh, the eventual future, um, you know, it is, you know, an implementation. So, you know, with uh, this working group, we, you know, we really want to be the, the, the the clearinghouse for those cross-cutting safety concerns and bring those together, uh, bring the interest of SIG auth, bring the interest of uh, SIG policy into this overarching uh, safety concern and, you know, collaborate with, with those groups. JJ, or Sarah, do you have anything to add? Well, or any I think that like in SIG some off? ways, I, I haven't been involved in those working groups, but I'm like, we will do both less and more, right? Because that certainly initially, we're not going to get into the details of, of specific implementations and how that ties into, you know, the, um, the different, you know, like how we'll have representatives from Google. We won't dive into how it works inside of Google. We'll have representatives of Kubernetes and, and vice versa. And, and so we're already excited to have people involved in both groups um, for on the policy side. And I don't know, JJ, do you, is there anybody involved from the off side or do we need to reach out there? Um, no, I think uh, I've been in touch with Jordan Leggett, uh, and Jordan Leggett is aware of this. And I don't know if anybody else in Sigoth, uh, of course, Joe Joe Beda is aware of this, mm -hmm. but I don't know if anybody else that uh, uh, that that is aware uh, that I know of uh, that is aware of this effort. But uh, certainly, we, the uh, idea is to like reach out to them, and then. Uh, uh, and then uh, get them uh, get this cross pollinated like what Dan and uh, Sarah are saying. Yeah. And also you know, there is the uh, we've also noticed like bunch of uh, bunch of the discussions around ABAC versus RBAC versus like other things happening in quite a number of places, uh, whether it's in SIGOT slash SIG policy slash uh, uh, SPIFI slash OPA. <laughs> 
which are all the same discussion happening in multiple different places. But then uh, it's it's something that we can actually we feel like we can solidify uh, a structured conversation and structured understanding of what this means uh, within this group. And uh, those are the kind of problems I think initially we'll end up solving to give the structure and give a block architecture for what security concerns are that will fit in well with uh, the rest of the folks. I don't quite understand the overall scope. Uh, it's access control, but safety is a very vague term. And um, so I'm not sure what it covers and what it doesn't cover. Um, also, um, obviously we've, we've got Notary and Tough in CNCF, which are obviously concerned to some extent with um, uh, access control, but in a slightly different way. And I, I'm not sure if those are, would be considered relevant or not, because I don't understand the overall scope. So I didn't hear nature, what the projects you referred to were? The update framework and notary. Notary. So in terms of the scope, um, the, we've, we've, uh, we're, <laughs> we've spent a lot of time wordsmithing this and um, it's not quite perfect. Um, but what we found is that uh, there's there's a, a, a big, uh, there's sort of, it's hard to put bounds around this. And this is why we need this vocabulary. We, for a while we were talking about policy, but policy is very expansive space. Um, we, we focused on access control, but it's, it, you know, that's sort of a way of not talking about policy, which is an implementation. But it's more than access because you um, there's certain configuration management which could be a vulnerability. Like if I don't, you know, if I have, um, you know, quotas or so forth. And the truth is, we don't know exactly what the bounds are, but we know that um, from the, the the discovery we've done so far that there isn't alignment on what it means to have a secure architecture or a secure like what it means to make sure that your system is protected in a consistent way when you have multiple pieces of software in different clouds or on-prem and cloud that have different definitions of how they secure their systems and so um, so we want to dig in so that this is clearly defined where we're not saying you know, we've said, okay, well, like, if I deploy a piece of software and it has a vulnerability, that's out of scope, right? But that I was allowed to deploy that software and that it was configured in this way, that's in scope, right? I think, but it's generally um, this, like, what is the secure architecture and how do we know that, how we intended to deploy it, our intention matches the reality when I have 10,000 VMs across multiple clouds. So in, sh in short, imagine, uh, imagine uh, we are imagining how it would look like if we were to implement uh, AAA authentication, authorization, and auditing uh, across heterogeneous systems uh, with episodic access and things that needs to get addressed part of that. Right, and uh, it's a well-defined protocol, but uh, given the complexity of the heterogeneous system, uh, it's not a well-understood and a well-structured end-to-end architecture. And that's essentially what we are after. So I guess it sounds like the update framework notary would definitely be in scope, because that's controlling how you deploy software, for example. But you're saying things like, Intrusion detection are definitely not in scope because that's nothing to do with intended deployment, although it's tooling related to whether things behave as intended. So I don't know, it's a bit. It does feel like you know, the concept of end to end is important here because um, it's likely to involve multiple different projects and therefore cannot be addressed by a single project. Right. And I, I think there, 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 uh, there's a couple uh, you know, things that we are not uh, that, that uh, help clarify. 
uh, and you know, I, I tried to, to to get us to distill down to a single word, uh, and uh, you know, we, we we went through uh, security, right? Secu you know, the secure working security working group. My goodness, that's a lot of you know a lot of uh, land grab, uh, and same thing with policy. Uh, you know, we looked at that. It was like, wow, like that. There's so many permutations out of that. So uh, you know, safety and the secure access. Uh, you know, gives our uh, group focus, and um, we have uh, spent a lot of time in, in trying to get that clear. And uh, um, you know, we 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 know that that it is um, you know we we would love uh, you know that the, the a uh, turn of phrase that would uh, you know get everybody uh, aligned and understand immediately what uh, what we're talking about. Uh, so we understand that as as a bit of a gap. Um, but uh, you know, th this is this is the the space that um, you know seems focused enough that that allows us to uh, really add a lot of value uh, uh, while still making progress. Okay, well, we're low on time. I think the key next step here is for people to, well, first of all, thank you to the presenters. Um, I think this is a difficult area. We've got a lot of different concerns from top down and bottom up. Um, I don't want CNCF to become an organization where working groups instruct individual projects kind of what to do, because they will typically be exploring things very close to what users want. Um, if something like this became drifted away from, for example, what's happening in and the parts of Kubernetes that are concerned with security, that would probably be a, a concern because it would be unlikely that um, people would pay attention to the group if it was differing from what was happening in practice. So I think you'll need to figure out how to do that. And the second area is, as Justin brought up, scope. So I would strongly recommend that everybody use the GitHub issue to help the team around this proposal to clarify those two areas, please. We did see this previously with this storage group um, where there were, at least at, at the beginning, there were sort of parallel, parallel efforts around what's happening in Kubernetes APIs and what's happening in the working group. So the, the sooner those two things are brought together, the, the better for everybody. So let's take this offline and take it to GitHub and then come back in, a, in another TC and get an update. Does that sound good? Great. Okay, you're not. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Great. Anyone else want to say anything else about that? Um, I think we've got a couple of minutes left to have an update from Ken on the reference architecture if you want to, Ken. Yeah, sure. I, um, just for everyone on the call here, I've um, sent out a couple of dates on a um, issues list on the CNCF um, GitHub. So if you would like to join a uh, kickoff meeting, we're going to have a meeting, I think, on Monday afternoon at 2 o'clock Pacific time. I'll um, set up a um, meeting invite on the CNCF calendar for that time frame. And um, if you're able to join us, please do. And we are going to be looking at the existing reference architecture and the landscape work and the proposed um, next level down of detail for more of a technical reference architecture um in that meeting and all feedback and comments are welcome so um, please join us if you can and i'll just remind folks that we have a lot of users now at landscape.cncf.io or just l.cncf.io and that is based on off of this reference architecture so for folks who are not happy with the categories that we have now or think they should be combined or split up or such it's ken's work here that uh, will lead to the next generation of the landscape. Okay, I think either I'm getting cut off or Dan is, but I think we've reached the end of the meeting. There is no TOC on May the 1st, repeat. No TOC on May the 1st. Can, can you just repeat that, Chris? Yeah, cancellation went out. Great, thanks. Okay. And see everyone in no, Copenhagen thanks. if you're attending. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thanks everybody. Take care.